absolute horror of this one incident exemplifies the desperation of an opposition movement constantly under lethal threat from a regime dead set on staying in power. This is the dictatorial regime of Alexander Lukashenko. This is the harsh brutality faced by the Belarusian people every day. Since attempting to steal the presidential election in August of 2020, the Lukashenko regime's repression has grown exponentially. Hundreds of courageous political prisoners populate Belarusian jails. Several have been killed. Despite this pressure, the people of Belarus continue to turn out, standing up for their rights. The repressive reach of this regime came into sharp relief three weeks ago when Raman Pratasevich and Sofia Saipaga were arrested, victims of a hijacking ordered by the state. The Biden administration has rightfully made support for human rights the centerpiece of its foreign policy. How we respond to Belarus will send a message not only to the regime in Minsk, but to autocrats around the world. This is a critical test, one the United States must pass. The United States will pass this test by leading the international community on human rights and democracy, by leading an international sanctions effort, leading by clearly, publicly, and frequently expressing solidarity with the democratic opposition and the people of Belarus. Ultimately, a democratic Belarus is up to its people to determine and to achieve. That is their sovereign responsibility. But the United States has also a responsibility to maintain pressure on the regime a responsibility to live up to the vision set by the Biden administration. And that starts by taking a few key steps. First, sanctions. The U.S. reimposed sanctions on nine Belarusian entities is a welcome development, but it did little to change Lukashenko's calculus. Working with Europe, the administration should impose sanctions on the Belarusian state bank, Belarusian sovereign debt, and the energy and potash industries. It's time to increase the pressure. Second, we need to stand with the opposition in Belarus. I appreciate that members of our committee, Senator Shaheen, Portman, and Murphy, met with the opposition in Valinas last week. Lukashenko needs to see over and over that the international community does not see him as legitimate, full stop. To that end, Belarusian opposition leadership should be invited to the G7 summit in the United Kingdom next week. We should never pass up an opportunity to express solidarity with these courageous activists. Finally, we need to see a robust investigation and a focused set of penalties in response to the hijacking of the May 23rd Rainier flight. A lackluster response will send a crystal clear signal to autocrats in every corner of the world. It is open season on democratic activists abroad. Go ahead, target at will. The Kremlin has already seized the initiative and last week began forcing activists off planes for arrest. Since May 23rd, we have heard a lot of rhetoric, but little action. I welcome the measures to block Belarusian flights into Europe, and the EU should consider blocking Belarusian ships from its ports. A weak response will only welcome continued aggression. Alexander Lukashenko is often called the last dictator in Europe, but unfortunately he's not. Vladimir Putin is sitting right next door, constantly exerting pernicious influence across the region. As the Belarusian activists tried to commit suicide in Minsk last week, Putin took Lukashenko out for a yacht cruise on the Black Sea. The Russian leader sees opportunity. So I look forward to hearing from Ambassador Fisher on how the department assesses this relationship and how we can work to ensure that Putin does not gain further advantage in the region. The people of Belarus deserve a chance to live in a democratic society. They have sacrificed greatly. Some have paid the ultimate sacrifice, and hundreds sit in jail as political prisoners. I hope that this hearing does two things. I hope that it sends a clear message of solidarity to the Belarusian people. Second and most importantly, I want this hearing to advance real policy options for the United States and our allies in Europe. With that, let me recognize the ranking member, Senator Risch, for his remarks. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Last year, on August 9th, the Belarusian election was stolen from its people. Uh, Alexander Lukashenko, who has ruled Belarus with an iron fist since 1994, has reacted violently to challengers. 
Despite brutal repression, the citizens of uh, Bel uh, Belarus have spent the past year peacefully protesting the authoritarian regime in an effort to restore the proper results of the election. The United States has followed the events in Belarus closely and has worked to support those who stand for freedom and democracy. We have imposed sanctions on uh, Belarusian officials who are responsible for violence, repression, and election fraud. And we continue to work with our European partners to increase pressure on Lukashenko's regime. I'm very glad to see Ambassador Julie Fisher with us today. Although she has not yet been able to visit her post in Minsk due to the Belarusian government's refusal to grant her a visa, Ambassador Fisher has been working diligently to fulfill her duties, both by coordinating the embassy from afar and by working with our allies in the region and the exiled opposition groups that strive to bring democracy and the rule of law to Belarus. Madam Ambassador, I hope to hear from you about the current bilateral relationship as well as the ways in which Putin is helping to prop up uh, Mr. Lukashenko. Uh, from uh, Ms. Tian Nuskaya, the likely winner of the 2020 Belarusian presidential election, I look forward to hearing about her plans to take Belarus forward. As leader of the opposition movement, she has preserved despite, she has persevered despite intense persecution by Lukashenko's regime. I'm also very glad that we have had this chance to talk with Jamie Fly, President and CEO of Radio Free Europe, uh, Radio Liberty, about the media situation in Belarus. Jamie is an expert in European affairs, human rights, global media, and disinformation campaigns by global adversaries. In addition, he's no stranger to our committee, having served as National Security Advisor to Senator Rubio for more than four years. There have long been restrictions on, pe on press in uh, uh, Belarus, but Lukashenko has recently tightened his grip and grown bolder in his crackdown on press organizations and independent journalists who seek to hold him accountable. Lukashenko's government has uh, passed draconian laws aimed at silencing the populace. Journalists have had their offices and homes raided and have been arrested, tortured, and even killed. Several RFE RL journalists are in Lukashenko's prisons. Just a few weeks ago, the world watched the shameless kidnapping of uh, a journalist when Belarusian authorities forcibly diverted his commercial flight to land in Minsk so they could carry out his arrest. Persecution of the free press is only a part of the oppression uh, Belarusians face under Lushenka's illegitimate rule. This time last year, Lukashenko let it be known that he was not going to play fair in the election. Belarusian authorities began, their, uh, began with arresting opposition activists and candidates, notably Ms. Tihanuskia's husband, and protests rose up around the country. Hundreds of thousands of Belarusians participated in peaceful demonstrations in the run-up to the August elections and were met with brutal violence from the authorities. More recently, he banned legalized, the, he, more recently, he legalized the use of lethal force against protesters and banned most Belarusians from leaving the country. For more than 25 years, Lukashenko has run uh, uh, Belarus as his personal dictatorship. In contrast to the democratic progress made by Belarus neighbors, Lukashenko has been able to operate outside of the international standards due to the support he receives from the only other European autocrat worse than he is, Vladimir Putin. With Putin's support and by his example, Lukashenko believes he can rule with impunity. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today on how we can bring that to an end. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Risch. Uh, we'll now turn to Ambassador Julie Fisher. Ambassador Fisher was confirmed by the Senate in December of last year and has provided an essential link to the Belarusian Democratic opposition. We welcome you back to the committee. We look forward to hearing uh, the administration's views on our policy moving forward. Your full statement will be included in the record. I'd ask you to summarize your remarks about five minutes or so, so we can have an opportunity to have a conversation with you. Ambassador. Yep. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Chairman Menendez, Ranking Member Risch, distinguished members of this committee, thank you for inviting me today to discuss our policy in Belarus. Guided by the Belarus Democracy Act, the United States has consistently supported a free, independent, and democratic Belarus. I would like to start by thanking Chairman Menendez and Ranking Member Risch for this committee's sustained commitment to Belarus's future. In particular, Senator Shaheen's recent visit to Vilnius, together with Senators Portman and Murphy, 
and this hearing itself are evidence of the high priority placed by the Congress on Belarus. Ten months ago, I appeared before this committee. That was August 5th, four days before the fraudulent August 9th election and the subsequent brutal crackdown on democratic activists that ensued. Four days before the world would be captivated by images of 100,000 Belarusians peacefully protesting on the streets of Minsk. Four days before everything changed, not just inside Belarus, but beyond its borders in the heart of Europe, with significant repercussions for European security. Despite the oppression, the violence, and the turmoil that followed, the events of the past year provide glimmers of hope. A new generation of brave Belarusians, with courageous women at the forefront, have emerged. They represent a Belarus determined to chart its own path. They represent a Belarus in which wearing a red and white dress, hanging a flag, or playing a particular song will not result in torture, forced confession, or even death. Take, for example, Mrs. Svetlana Tsikhanovskaya, from whom you will hear later today. Mrs. Tsikhanovskaya stood defiantly together with Maria Kolesnikova and Veronika Tsepkala to compete in an election and inspire the world. Forced to flee to neighboring Lithuania, which has generously offered her and thousands of others safe haven, Mrs. Tsikhanovskaya quickly emerged as the leader of the democratic opposition and the face of a new Belarus. Consider as well journalist Roman Pratasevich. During my recent trip to Vilnius, Roman's dedication and his selflessness in the face of very real threats from a ruthless dictator were on display. Roman's arrest after the forced diversion of Ryanair Flight 4978 is further evidence, as if the world needed it, of the regime's utter disregard for international norms and reflects the new lows to which Lukashenko and his foreign backers are willing to sink. Belarus under Lukashenko will never realize its full potential. Lukashenko and his regime hold more than 470 political prisoners, among them journalists, bloggers, artists, teachers, everyday citizens, not masters of intrigue, many of whom report squalid conditions and physical abuse. They put the nation's bravest and brightest on public display in cages, <coughs> like Belsat reporters Katsyarna Andreeva and Daria Chultsova. Thinking only of himself and his cronies, Lukashenko has been steadily ceding Belarus's sovereignty to Russia for personal gain since he assumed power more than a quarter century ago. The Belarusian people are rightly concerned about the Kremlin's desire to erode their sovereignty and independence, as are we. For as long as Lukashenko remains in power, Belarus faces absorption into Russia under the Union State Agreement, with dire consequences for the people of Belarus, for their voice, their agency, their culture, and their identity. Mr. Chairman, as you said, the people of Belarus deserve better. They deserve a future in which Daria and Katsyarina and others like Ihar Losik can participate in the governance of their country without putting themselves and their families at risk. The United States will and must do its utmost to support those who seek to make that future a reality. And as I assured the committee last summer, we will not do so in any way that supports or enriches the regime nor endangers our shared security. In partnership with Poland and Lithuania and the U European Union, the United States has sought to galvanize a broad coalition of like-minded governments, civil society representatives, and Belarusians in exile to effect positive change. At the OSCE and the UN, we launched fact-finding missions into human rights abuses. And with partners like the European Union, the United Kingdom, and Canada, we coordinated and continue to coordinate on new rounds of sanctions to promote accountability for those abuses. As announced by the White House on May 28th, additional sanctions are coming, and they are coming soon. By imposing visa restrictions, the State Department has made it clear that individuals responsible for stifling Belarusian democracy are not welcome in the United States. And at the same time, we are strengthening our assistance to the people of Belarus. Since August, we have identified over $20 million in additional assistance, which aims to provide emergency support to civil society leaders forced to flee Belarus, to sustain grassroots voices within Belarus, to promote independent media, to document human rights violations, and to help those inside and outside Belarus remain unified. Senators, Belarus is a country at a crossroads. What happens next will impact the lives of future generations, 
not just within its borders, but across the European continent. I thank you for this opportunity today, and I look forward to your questions. Well, thank you, Ambassador, for those insights. Uh, we'll start a, a series of uh, five-minute questions. Um, I, I'm glad to hear you say that more sanctions are coming. Uh, I don't believe in sanctions just for the sake of sanctions, but in this case, uh, there is a clear need for them. Uh, in order to impose sanctions on Belarus, the administration is relying on Executive Order uh, 13405 that was issued under the Bush administration in 2006. A lot has changed since then, including passage of the Belarus Democracy, Human Rights, and Sovereignty Act last year. Why has the administration not issued a new executive order on Belarus sanctions? And when can we expect one? And if you put your microphone on, please. Sorry about that. It's okay. Um, thank you, Senator. Let me assure you that as the President's statement, as the White House statement indicated on May 28th, uh, we are working hard uh, on a new executive order at this time. You're exactly right. 2006 was a long time ago. It was a very different world. And there is room for us to do an awful lot with a new executive order. That is an effort that is underway. Um, our goal remains that we are we are focused on promoting accountability for those individuals and entities who are responsible for or are complicit in the regime's violent repression of civil society and for those human rights abuses. So we will continue to bring new authorities and new tools of pressure to bear. Um, we will raise the costs of the violence and the repression that the regime is inflicting upon the people. All right, I'm glad we're going to raise the costs. The question is how soon, mm -hmm. uh, because the more we wait, uh, the more impunity takes place. Let me ask you, the Belarusian organization Nexta published an account of Lukashenko's corruption entitled Lukashenko, a gold mine. Yes. What is your assessment of that report? Um, sir, I would say that the reports that we have seen, the information that has been gathered by Nexta has been incredibly valuable to us. Um, we are focused on a new executive order on the earliest possible timeline. I expect that we, I can assure you that the interagency inside the administration is working on this question every single day right now. Let me ask you this. If, mm -hmm. you, if you think it's, uh, the report was uh, of significant value, if two, are there Magnitsky sanctions measures that can be taken against enablers of the corruption with this regime? Sir, we've been very closely looking at exactly which authorities we can apply to a variety of individuals. I think there is an opportunity to apply Magnitsky sanctions. Yes. Uh, what are, who, can you share some specific figures within the regime that enable this corruption? Sir, I'd be happy to. I'd be happy to follow up with you afterwards in terms of who I see as the targets and in, in terms of who we. Uh, envision in the next round. As we are working to finalize those questions, I think it would be a little premature to, to discuss individual targets. Okay, well, I'd, lo I'd love to have that, including mm -hmm. in an appropriate setting. In her written testimony, Ms. Tsiki mm -hmm. recommends that 24 Belarusian entities in the banking, oil, fertilizer, meteorology, mm -hmm. wood sectors be subjected to U.S. sanctions. Um, this is her view, her testimony, which we'll hear from her in a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, can I get your commitment that the, the administration will review this list and seriously vet these entities for sanctions? Yes, sir, you can. Um, now, let me turn to, um, I'm very concerned about the burgeoning threats to freedom, democracy, and the rule of law from autocrats around the world, including the direct targeting of activists and journalists. Uh, as you referred to, the Belarusian regime's hijacking last month of the Ryanair flight in order to arrest journalist uh, Roman Pratasevich is the starkest example. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the status of this investigation, and what steps will the administration take, both unilaterally and with our allies, since the hijacking to impose consequences on Lukashenko to dissuade other dictators from committing similar abuses. Otherwise, the open skies won't be open. They'll be open for pursuing, uh, you know, political activists, journalists, uh, and, and those who are seen as a threat to some regime. Um, Senator, I, I very much share your concerns about um, the need for a strong response um, to this. It, it, these are exactly the messages. We cannot allow the dictators of the world to take from this incident. Um, specifically with regards to your question about the status of the investigation, uh, I think we have seen the International Civil Aviation Organization take swift action 
They have an investigation underway. We anticipate at least a preliminary report out of that process uh, by the end of this month, and we will be tracking that very closely. Um, we are working with our allies who are most directly and our partners who are most directly impacted by this flight, and that would be, of course, uh, Greece as the uh, origination point for this flight, Lithuania as the destination point, um, Ireland as the headquarters of uh, Ryanair, and Poland as the country uh, to which this uh, subsidiary is registered uh, on all elements of, the, of a variety of investigations surrounding this incident. Is this part of the interagency review in terms of what potential <laughs> sanctions may take place? Yes, sir. Okay. Senator Risch. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Fisher, I've read lots of reports about the relationship between Putin and Lukashenko. I'd be really interested to hear your description of that. Um, thank you, Senator. Uh, it's um, really, it's a very important question. Um, let me maybe start by talking about Lukashenko's um, relationship with Russia, if I might. And that is to say that over the quarter century since he has taken power, in my view, Lukashenko has been ceding Belarus's sovereignty and independence <coughs> to Russia that entire period. This isn't something new. Um, this has very much uh, been a feature of his uh, term um, in, in, as he has ruled Belarus. And what I have observed is that the people of Belarus are gravely concerned about Russia's support for Lukashenko's whims and deprivations and as he imposes those on Belarus, Russia continues to provide support uh, to a leader whose only motivation at this point is his own grip on power. Uh, I'm deeply troubled by Russia's willingness to facilitate the regime's repression and its attempts through the last month to normalize Lukashenko's extensive human rights abuses and violations through false equivalencies and their whataboutism. Uh, we find Russia's continued rhetorical, diplomatic, military and financial support for the Lukashenko regime, regime part of a consistent pattern on the Kremlin's part to ensure Belarus's dependency. Thank you. I appreciate those thoughts. What, what are your, based on your knowledge, what, what do you see as being the conditions or the events or scenarios where things change uh, in, in Belarus? Senator Risch, I think the real question is, what is it we all can do in the West that will help get the political prisoners out from behind bars so that there can be a dialogue that leads to a new free and fair election? That is what uh, Mrs. Tsikhanouskaya, from whom you'll hear later, that is what she is calling for as the next steps. We have been working to apply pressure to Lukashenko to try to drive the regime into a dialogue. Uh, the costs of remaining outside of a dialogue have become quite high for him. We have yet, not yet uh, changed the calculus. Uh, we have not yet changed his decision-making uh, calculations, but we will continue to add those costs. Uh, there can be no normalization. Uh, it is as if the regime believes a page will be turned and they can go back to building relations with the West when they have so clearly walked backwards um, uh, from where they were two years ago in terms of the human rights situation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I understand we have Senator Cardin via uh, virtually. Senator Cardin? Okay. Then while we wait for him, we shall go to Senator Shaheen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you very much, Ambassador Fisher, for all of your great work on what's happening in Belarus. As you pointed out in your opening statement, Senators Murphy, Portman, and I had a chance to stop in Lithuania on our trip to Ukraine and Georgia last week and meet with uh, Svetlana Tikhonovskaya, and I can tell you how impressed I think we all were with her courage, with the motivation of the opposition, and their willingness to travel around Europe to build support for the opposition movement. I, it was particularly interesting to see the juxtaposition of that meeting and the picture that appeared in international um, newspapers of Lukashenko and Putin on Putin's yacht in 
um, while they were incarcerating journalists and members of the opposition. The two of them were out having a good time on his yacht, obviously not at all concerned about what's happening with um, human rights and in Belarus. I, I wonder, one of the things that we heard that was of concern to other countries in the region was this proposed union between Russia and Belarus. Can you talk about what you, what you think the implications of that are? Um, thank you, Senator. Um, the proposed union state is, um, is a process, it, this, this idea of uh, Russia and Belarus um, combining at a variety of different levels for a sort of supranational association. And uh, this is a process that has been underway between the two countries for two decades. Uh, it is not one that has moved quickly, nor is it one that has moved particularly transparently. Um, and what is in it for each of the two countries is also not entirely clear. Um, what I have observed is that Moscow has uh, in every way taken advantage of Belarus's vulnerabilities as they have endured this dictatorship of Alexander Lukashenko, and they will continue to do so. Uh, they will continue to, um, to use Belarus for their own purposes, which leaves the people of Belarus with very little voice, very little agency in their own future. And the question of what the people of Belarus want for their future is, of course, one of the most significant motivators for what took place last summer. It is the desire of the people of Belarus to have a voice in their future. And that is one of the pieces of the union state that concerns me greatly, is what happens to them in that process. Absolutely. And again, it's a concern that we had heard, not just from mm -hmm. the opposition leader, but from others in the region. One of the things that I was also impressed with was the support from Lithuania, and they also mentioned Poland mm -hmm. in uh, supporting the opposition leaders, who many of whom are living in Lithuania now. Can you talk about what more we might do in the United States to support the efforts of both of their country, those two countries, as they work to support opposition leaders? Uh, thank you. I, I think there is room for us to do an awful lot more uh, with regards to both with in support of the democratic opposition outside of Belarus's borders. There is also room for us to do more in coordination with our allies, our frontline allies, uh, our partners in the region. Uh, Lithuania and Poland, as you, as you note, are carrying an incredibly heavy burden um, as they host opposition elements as they helped, as they helped to protect them. I, I would note that um, in Poland, they have been hosting generations of opposition who have been forced to flee over, over the decades of Lukashenko's uh, regime. Uh, and Lithuania, of course, is doing a tremendous amount to not only to welcome those who are fleeing uh, persecution and repression, but to keep them safe. This is an area where I think the United States can work very closely with our partners. Um, I would also note, uh, Senator, um, I know Ukraine was also a stop on your trip. There has been an awful lot of economic flight to Ukraine. Uh, a lot of uh, technology folks have fled to Ukraine. We have seen a prominent um, a journalist, uh, analytical observer, uh, whose name was mentioned in the forced confession uh, from Roman Pratasevich, felt that he had to leave Belarus. Uh, so I, I think it's important to, to recognize, right, we have three allies and an important partner, all of whom are significantly impacted by these events. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, and thank you for your good work in this regard and your, your trip. I understand that... Um, hey, Chairman, Senator Portman's coming out right now. I understand that Senator Portman's about to make a grand entrance. <laughs> Senator Portman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you, Ambassador. I appreciate your opening statement and the opportunity to hear some of the back and forth. Um, I was privileged to go, as you know, to Lithuania last week with Senator Shaheen, Senator Murphy, and 
have a chance to um, debrief with the Lithuanians about what's going on uh, in Belarus. You're not there because you can't be there. Uh, we weren't able to go there. But uh, on the other hand, we were able to get uh, some good input, including, as you know, from uh, Ms. Sinka Skaya, who we're going to hear from in just a moment. Um, I guess my, uh, my biggest takeaway was the degree to which Russia is using Belarus as a staging ground, in essence, uh, for their military and the impact that has on the region, in particular the northern border of Ukraine. Ukraine already has an eastern border they have to defend, and Russia has recently sent over 100,000 troops to that region, including equipment which would indicate that they have designs to, uh, to come back since they left the equipment there. Um, and now they have to worry about their northern border as well. Can you talk a little about the, the, the Russian intentions in Belarus? I understand they have a couple bases already and they've asked for a third base. Um, talk a little about their military posture and uh, what you see as um, the likely scenario uh, with regard to Russian involvement in Belarus. Thank you, Senator, um, and, and thank you again for, for uh, taking part in the trip last week. It was so important to both the, to the democratic opposition, to our allies, and, and to our efforts. In terms of uh, Russia's role, particularly, uh, as you mentioned, militarily, I would, I would start by saying that, again, it is Lukashenko's willingness to increase dependency on Russia in every possible sphere uh, that has brought him to the point of being in no position, really, to barely having a say in what it is that Russia would decide to do militarily in, in Belarus. Um, there has been uh, an integration of uh, military and security uh, forces over, again, the decades of his tenure. Um, it's important to acknowledge that Russian troops in Belarus, that's not new. Russian troops have been in Del Belarus for a long time. The question is how many more? Uh, I would also acknowledge that this year is a year of the major Russian uh, military exercise, Zapad, which uh, we are watching very closely uh, to see how uh, this exercise will unfold, what, uh, what kinds of troops and equipment move into Belarus, and how much of that leaves. Uh, the Zapad exercise is one that um, NATO, in particular, pays very close attention to, um, and we will continue to do that this year. Can you confirm that Russia has requested another base in the country? I'm sorry? Can you confirm that Russia has asked for another base in Belarus? I can't confirm that, no. Uh, that's what we heard in, in Lithuania, mm -hmm. and I thought we heard it from both our U.S. ambassador and also from the foreign minister. Mm -hmm. um, with regard to sanctions, we talked about the need for shifting uh, to a more effective means of persuading uh, Belarus to stop some of their uh, malign activities, including obviously in, in response to the Ryanair uh, jet incident. My question for you is, do sectoral s sanctions make more sense? Um, and if so, which sectors would be most appropriate to be focused on and what difference would it make? Um, thank you, sir. I think in a state-run economy, which Belarus is, 70 percent of the of Belarus's economy is controlled by the state. It's very Soviet-style economy. I think uh, it is important to acknowledge just how important sectoral sanctions can be uh, to depriving uh, the regime uh, of finance uh, and funding that is used to inflict violence on the people. And I believe that it is um, the clearest signal that we can send of our rejection uh, of these tactics. So uh, I believe the new, a new executive order and the work that the White House has directed that is underway now, uh, you, we are working through targets. It is very important as we work through this process that we take a very careful and thoughtful approach with regards to understanding the impact that we will have on the desired targets, that we understand the impact to the people of Belarus uh, who, who could feel the effects, and that we understand the impacts to um, American interests uh, as well, and to that of our, of our allies and partners. So 
I'd like to assure you that we are going through a very thoughtful process and that we are working through that with due speed and a sense of urgency. Thank you. Senator Cardin, I understand, is now with us virtually. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much, and let me thank the Ambassador. Uh, in addition to serving on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, I also chair the U.S. Helsinki Commission, and we're going to have a meeting of the OSCE Parliamentary Assembly early next month. We expect a large U.S. Uh, participation in that. I will also be chairing a hearing with the chair in office, the Foreign Minister of Sweden, uh, so my, my question to you, Madam Ambassador, is you talked about the OSCE, you've talked about a multinational uh, approach. What should we be asking from the OSCE uh, to advance our interest in Belarus? So do you have specific suggestions as to what the OSCE can do more effectively in, in helping the people of Belarus? Thank you, Senator Cardin. Um, we have really looked, uh, for, for you to be aware, uh, we have really looked at the permanent council at the OSCE as the venue for delivering clear messages about how Belarus's authorities have failed to meet their international obligations. And as you note, uh, the Swedes as chairman in office and Foreign Minister Linda have played an incredibly active role in trying to create the conditions for dialogue and in trying to bring the parties to the table. Um, we have seen thus far insufficient results uh, at the OSCE, largely because Lukashenko refuses to engage and has rebuffed the OSCE's efforts to facilitate the dialogue. Nonetheless, uh, this is an effort that I believe, I continue to believe that we should keep at um, and work uh, in partnership with the Swedes uh, and other participating states in the OSCE context. I thank you for that. If you have specific recommendations, the, the meeting will take place later. The hearing will be, uh, I think, next week. But, but later this week, we'll have uh, next month. We'll have a chance to meet with parliamentarians. Mm -hmm. I just have a question. There's, there's obviously uh, the the protesters in Belarus are extremely brave people. They're out in great numbers, protesting against their government. Uh, we've talked about sanctions against those that would violate the rights of the the people of Belarus. I'm concerned about their safety. Is there more aggressiveness that we can be, the international community, community can be, in order to protect the safety of the protesters in Belarus? Sir, I, I absolutely share your concern about the safety uh, of protesters. And, you know, who is a protester in Belarus these days is, um, uh, again, it's it's somebody who's willing, who dares to wear the colors red and white, or someone who hangs their laundry in a way that's unacceptable. A protester these days in Belarus is labeled with a terrorist or an extremist uh, uh, target. Um, and I do think there is room, sir, for us to do much more in terms of rejecting the use uh, of these labels and not allowing um, Lukashenko and his regime to use these labels to then put international law enforcement tools to work against his opposition. I think this is an area we can explore more and uh, I would really be delighted to work with you and your team, sir, to, to explore what more we could accomplish both at the meeting next week um, and in the weeks and months ahead. And we've had bipartisan uh, support here to minimize the use of red notice in regards to oppressive countries mm -hmm. trying to get international uh, uh, cooperation in, in, in retaining or arresting people um, from uh, that are legitimately protesting and seek asylum. So yes, yeah, so we will very much uh, look to you for advice as to how we can protect the people of Belarus. Um, you know our. our Complaint is with the government, not with the people. And uh, we need to be selective in, the, in how we use our, our power and sanctions. we we'll make it clear we're going to be tough against anyone who would violate international norms of human rights. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, th thank you, uh, Senator Cardin. Uh, I understand that we have Senator Okay, 
and so um, we have no, at the moment, we don't have a Republican colleague seeking recognition, so we will go to Senator Murphy. Uh, thank you very, very much, Mr. Chairman, for holding this uh, hearing. Uh, Ambassador, thank you for your work. Thanks for your assistance to Senator Shaheen Portman and I in getting ready for uh, our trip. Um, I um, was incredibly impressed um, by uh, Svetlana Tikhonovskaya and her team. Um, the duress under which they are operating is just unfathomable. Uh, and uh, I'm glad to be exploring new ways that we can support them. Um, you may have covered this in your prepared testimony, but it maybe bears repeating. Um, Lukashenko's claim is that the entire opposition movement is some U.S. front. Um, we're sort of using Belarus to get at Putin as part of sort of great power competition. It is important to sort of recognize what the Belarusian opposition mm -hmm. is asking for and how it's different, for instance, than what's happening in Ukraine, where in Ukraine the protesters, you know, very clearly wanted an orientation with Europe and with the West. That's very different than what's happening in Belarus today. Um, this is not about an alignment um, with countries to uh, the west of Belarus. This is just about human rights, dignity, the ability to determine for themselves what the future of that country is. Isn't that right? Sir, I think that's exactly right. And I think, um, you know, what we are seeing in Belarus, if I put it in a bit of context from what I have experienced in the former Soviet Union um, over my years of service, Right, this is a delayed transition, right? The, Lukashenko has held this grip on power. He has run Belarus in a very Soviet style for his quarter of a century. And what we see from the opposition is a clear desire. It, it, is, it is different from what happened in Ukraine. It is different from what we've seen happen um, in countries in the Caucasus. Uh, because this is the people saying, we want to have a voice. Um, it, largely, the, the demonstrations last summer, to a large extent, had an awful lot to do with COVID. It had a lot to do with uh, how the authorities had failed to respond to a health crisis. There were economic impacts. Uh, but immediately, what we saw, as people pointed out shortcomings from the regime, was the government went immediately, reverted back to, again, its Soviet-style tools. So. What the opposition is looking for now, what that democratic opposition, which again, we can acknowledge that Lukashenko has put his opposition either behind bars or he has driven them to the borders of the country and kicked them out. So as we engage with those outside of the borders, the ones with whom we can engage, what they tell us explicitly they are after is the release of political prisoners and the conduct of an, a new election so that the people's voices can be heard. This isn't about uh, the European Union. This certainly isn't about NATO. This is about a country that would like the opportunity to find some prosperity and stability for its own citizens in a state that serves the citizens, not the other way around. Uh, well said. Um, let me ask you one additional question, and, and that's um, on how we uh, sort of uncover and publicize the sort of endemic corruption of the Lukashenko government. Navalny is um, really dangerous to Putin in part because he has done a very effective job at exposing the financial holdings of uh, Putin and Medvedev and others. Um, we have capacities to do that as well, along with our European partners. Um, OFAC is a perpetually underfunded um, uh, agency, a treasury that, uh, with the right resources, can do a good job of exposing the way in which these dictators abroad hide their money. Um, but um, the media can do that as well. We're going to hear testimony on the next panel from uh, Jamie Fly, who's going to talk about how, how um, Radio for Europe and Radio Liberty need additional funding and additional resources to be able to do that work themselves and expose for the uh, Belarusian people uh, the extent to which Lukashenko and his friends have stolen uh, from uh, the people of that country. Um, what do you think about the tools that we have at our disposal to just tell the story mm -hmm. um, of how corrupt this regime is? Mm -hmm. I think that what the 
committee is going to hear from the next panel, I think, is going to be incredibly important. Um, RFE, RL, and their work is absolutely essential to telling that public story that you reference. Um, I think what is so compelling about the information that has been put out by Navalny <clears throat> is it reflects just how little investigative journalism exists um, in this part of the world and the importance of it. It is not a coincidence that the independent media has been Lukashenko's primary target um, in these months uh, since last summer uh, and the, the conduct of the election and in all of these years. Um, it's important to remember that in the lead up to the Ryan Air diversion, one of the, there were some, several significant events in the week before that, including the closure of the largest in-country independent media, uh, Toot Bai. So this target is, um, it's very clear. I, I, think, I think there is more for us to do in support of that independent media. I think the Global Engagement Center's work, if I could, uh, if I could tout that for a second, is absolutely essential in terms of how we counter some of the massive amounts of disinformation that are at work on the Belarus account. Um, and uh, again, I know that uh, Jamie Fly will talk much more about what it is that RFE RL can do, and, and I'm quite supportive uh, of that. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, Senator Kane. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Madam Ambassador. And I just want to follow up on this point about uh, press freedom in particular. Mm -hmm. uh, Reporters Without Borders calls Belarus, quote, Europe's most dangerous country for journalists. Mm -hmm. In 2020, journalists and other media workers were detained 480 times. In 2021, more than 30, uh, 30 media workers were convicted, detained, or faced criminal charges by the end of May. In May recently, as you just indicated, Belarusian authorities launched a crackdown against Toot by and its employees had its license revoked last year. Um, June of 2020, video blogger and RFERL new media consultant E.R. Losek, and I suspect we'll hear more about her on the next panel, was arrested on charges of preparing to participate in a riot and disrupt public order. She's undergone repeated hunger strikes, been placed in solitary confinement, and reportedly attempted suicide. We've had a lot of hearings in this committee over the years where we've heard about persecution of journalists. Mm -hmm. It might be in Egypt, it might be the dismemberment of Virginia resident Jamal Khashoggi, Washington Post reporter, it might be in Honduras, it might be in Russia, all over the world um, when dictators want to uh, perpetrate atrocities and escape accountability, they go after media representatives. And uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Graham and I have introduced a bill that we call the International Press Freedom Act. We recently introduced it to create a new subcategory, an I-2 subcategory of non-immigrant visas for threatened journalists and their families, which would be sort of a strong statement of principle that we could, that, that we value uh, journalism, we value a, a robust First Amendment culture, and we will provide a haven for those who are practicing this profession who are threatened around the world. I don't have other questions for the ambassador. I think the, uh, the, especially the questions from those who have recently visited the region have really helped identify the challenges and the next panel will do the same. But I hope we might think about ways where we can um, deal with, it seems to me, kind of an expanding set of attacks on journalists around the world and that we might, prov we might find a way to provide uh, refuge in the United States for journalists and their families when they are under assault as they are in Belarus. Well, thank you, Senator Kane, and uh, certainly look forward to working with you on that. We'll, we'll have to get some of our colleagues to think about an immigration element that should be unifying, uh, at least, but it's certainly worthy, uh, worthy of it. And I also think we should be looking at some of our existing laws to see whether the, the um, persecution of journalists is specifically a category, for example, Magnitsky and other things to, to be considered. Uh, as sanctionable. Um, as I understand it, we have no one virtually or present. So I do have one or two final questions before we let you go, Ambassador. What specific measures should the U.S. look to advance at the OSCE, the Council of Europe, perhaps the European Court of Human Rights, to advance the human rights and democracy efforts in Belarus? 
Sir, I, I think there is room for us to continue to shine a spotlight on what is happening. I think there is, and I think that's sort of the minimum for, for what we can accomplish in those four. I think there is room for us to do much more um, in terms of pushing back, again, on Lukashenko's use of uh, international uh, law enforcement tools that he is trying to apply to those who simply don't agree with him, right? Uh, whether it's the red notices, um, whether as he looks to take his uh, levels of repression uh, beyond his own borders, I think there is, uh, there is a significant amount for us to do in coordination with the Europeans, with our allies, with those who share our values in rejecting this. Uh, you noted, sir, uh, that this is a test for us. You noted uh, that the message must be clear, not just to this dictator, but to all dictators, that we will not sit idly by. And these are the various fora. The UN, of course, is an important one uh, as well for pushing back uh, on exactly this kind of activity, and we will continue to do that. Well, I hope we meet the moment. Let me ask you this. NATO Secretary General Stoltenberg called this incident a state, his words, a state hijacking. Mm -hmm. So I was disturbed to see reports that NATO's efforts to penalize and cut ties with Belarus were stymied by Turkey, clearly working, in my view, at the behest of Russia. Can you help me understand the logic of Belarus's inclusion in the Partnership for Peace program, given recent events? Let me maybe start by saying, I think NATO's statement about the events was quite a strong one, and I would also acknowledge that we have an opportunity to hear from NATO again next week uh, as leaders convene in Brussels. Um, I, having spent uh, quite a bit of time at NATO, Getting to consensus at 30 is always um, a challenge on any set of issues. So the strong statement that emerged, I think, is quite important. I would note that Secretary General Stoltenberg announced uh, the Belarusians would not be welcome in NATO headquarters. I think that that speaks to the partnership. Uh, there are other elements. Let me maybe describe the partnership between NATO and Belarus um, as one that has, uh, has been quite limited for a very long time. This is not a rich and extensive partnership. So the questions of the next steps are ones that have to be dealt with uh, by the North Atlantic Council. They are questions that have to be dealt with by 30 allies together. Um, and I believe that they will give a thorough review to the question of the status of our partnership with Belarus, NATO's partnership with Belarus. All right, finally. Um, I understand that the Belarusian government has not provided you with a visa effectively blocking you from uh, traveling to Minsk and presenting your credentials. Uh, is it your intention to move to Lithuania, take up residence there so that you can engage with the democratic opposition on a full-time basis? Are you gonna to continue to operate as you're operating? I'm just trying to get a sense of mm -hmm. how we best use your good, uh, good uh, experience to, to the mm -hmm. best use. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that, um, Senator Menendez. The, um, the question of how I can be most effective, where I can be most effective, is one that I've been working very closely with the State Department's leadership on. Our goal remains, I, I want to be clear about it, our goal remains that I will undertake my duties in Minsk. Um, in the absence of a visa, of course, I will, I will work to be effective in advancing our policies and advancing our goals, I will work in any location where I can be effective. So uh, at this point, uh, you, uh, I think, understand I am regularly in the region. The question of uh, being there on a more regular basis is one we are thinking about very seriously. Well, we look forward to hearing what that conclusion is. Yes, sir. Uh, we certainly want you to be able to use the fullness of your experience and your knowledge and your advocacy mm -hmm. with uh, all of those who are engaged in democracy struggle as, as vibrantly as possible. So I think uh, we have no further colleagues at this moment ask questions of you. With the thanks of the committee, you're, you're excused, and we thank you for your service. Thank you, sir. Thank you.
Now, um, let me, uh, as the ambassador departs, let me um, uh, welcome uh, our guests for our second panel. Uh, first, uh, we are honored to be joined by Svetlana Tikhonovskaya, uh, the leader of the Belarusian Democratic Opposition. She is a school teacher by profession, but answered the call of her country to run for president last year. And she won. Let me say that again. She won. Since then, she has led an opposition movement from outside the country in Lithuania. And uh, I just want to say the Lithuanians are a tremendous people, a tremendous government. Uh, they are probably some of the stalwart uh, uh, advocates for uh, democracy and human rights uh, throughout Europe and the world. And I, I just want to salute them. Um, this is only one of many examples. I understand she's currently in Prague, where she is engaging with its parliament today. Uh, so thank you for joining us on this uh, busy day for you. We look forward very much to hear what you have to say, and we will have you on virtually in a moment. We also have with us uh, Jamie Fly, the president of Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. He's also joining us from Prague, where he is headquartered. RFE has, become, has come under increasing pressure lately in Russia, and I hope we can hear some ideas of how to better protect your journalists across the region. I'm just glad that you have rejoined RFE after the disgraceful treatment that you and the organization received from the last administration. We're fortunate to have you leading the organization. I ask you both to summarize your remarks in five minutes to allow time for questions. Your full statements will be entered into the record. And with that, we'll turn first to Ms. Tukanuskaya. I understand that we're having video troubles, but we have audio uh, opportunities, so we'd be happy to hear from Ms. Uh, Tikhonovskaya now. Ms. Tikhonovskaya, do we have you on? All right, while we wait to solve the technical problems, is Mr. Fly available? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, Mr. Fly, thank you very much for joining us and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Menendez, Ranking Member Risch, other members of the committee, I wanna thank you for holding this hearing and inviting me to testify. Uh, as has been noted, I'm President and CEO of Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, uh, which we refer to as RFERL. We're a multimedia news organization operating in 23 countries across Eurasia and 27 languages. Uh, we do our work on a daily basis in places where freedom of the press does not exist uh, or is under attack. Uh, we're funded by the U.S. Congress through an annual appropriation to the U.S. Agency for Global Media, and we believe that we're a living embodiment of America's commitment to freedom of the press and the vital role that the media plays in democracy. Uh, for more than 70 years, our journalists have revealed truths that governments and state-controlled media want to keep hidden. And in some cases, uh, including here in the Czech Republic, our work helped to change the course of history and help bring freedom to millions of people. Now we give our brave journalists the microphone, TV studio, increasingly the Facebook, Telegram, or Instagram account, and allow them to provide reporting directly to their communities. I'm humbled to be joining Svetlana Sikhanovskaya on this panel. She and her family have suffered immensely over the last year because of her willingness to speak on behalf of the Belarusian people. RFRL's Belarus service, known locally as Radio Svoboda or Radio Liberty, is one of the leading providers of news and analysis to audiences in Belarus. We are one of the few independent media outlets working in the Belarusian language and Svoboda has played a significant role in reporting in and on Belarus since the fraudulent election uh, in last, uh, last, uh, last August. 
As we covered the wave of civic participation ahead of the election, uh, we saw a spike in audience numbers with a record 24.8 million recorded views on YouTube in that key month in August 2020. And I would just note these are remarkable levels of engagement in a country of less than 10 million people. Svoboda has accomplished all of this despite extreme threats to our operations and our people in Belarus. It was already noted that our 29-year-old social media consultant, Ihar Losik, uh, was detained last June. Uh, he will soon mark one year in pretrial detention in Belarus. Ihar has been accused by authorities of preparing to disrupt public order ahead of last August's uh, election. And as has been noted, uh, he attempted in one case to take his life and has started two hunger strikes. He's been separated from his wife, Daria, and his two-year-old daughter for that entire time. And I spoke to Daria yesterday in advance of this hearing, and she asked me to share this message with the, the committee. She told me that Ihar finds himself in a dire situation. His fate and his freedom directly depend on international pressure on Lukashenko's regime. Numerous other uh, of our journalists in Belarus on assignment to report in recent months have been harassed, detained, jailed, stripped of their accreditations. Uh, in 2020 and 21, journalists other than Ihar have spent a total of 118 days in jail in Belarus. Our website has been blocked since last August. We've been relying on social media platforms like Telegram, Instagram, and YouTube. We've also gotten support from the Open Technology Fund uh, to provide circumvention technology to ensure that the people of Belarus are able to access our reporting. It's not just RFERL journalists under attack, as has been noted. There are multiple other news organizations being targeted. Reportedly, 34 media workers are currently behind bars awaiting trial or serving sentences. Uh, Tut Bai, as has been noted, Belsat, others have had offices raided in recent weeks. Uh, and there's the high profile cases of Katerina Andreev, uh, Daria Khusova, uh, who are now serving prison terms for literally the crime of streaming protest from an apartment window. Uh, the Lukashenko regime is trying to expand its targeting of the media in recent weeks, adding new amendments to its media law, which essentially criminalize journalism and make it much more difficult for journalists to do their jobs. Uh, I briefly wanted to note Russia's support for Lukashenko's efforts to control the information space. Uh, in the early months of the protests, at Lukashenko's request, the Kremlin sent Russian propagandists from Russian state TV uh, to assist at Belarus state TV channels, because many of those journalists at Belarus state TV started to resign from their jobs. Uh, at the same moment the Kremlin was doing this, RFURL sought to provide an alternative to Russian disinformation in Belarus and we sent some of our own Russia-based journalists to cover the events in Belarus for a very interested Russian public until those journalists from Russia, like other foreign journalists, were kicked out by the Belarusian government. Uh, as, as you noted, Mr. Chairman, RFRL is under significant pressure in Russia, which ramped up uh, in the immediate aftermath of the events in Belarus last fall. This crackdown is essentially trying to close our bureau in Moscow, which has existed for 30 years, uh, since 1991, when it was established at the invitation of President Yeltsin. We face millions of dollars in fines for failing to label our content as the products of so-called foreign agents, essentially spies uh, in the Russian context. Uh, and we've now had our bank accounts frozen inside Russia and court bailiffs visit our offices on several occasions to begin enforcement proceedings. Uh, briefly, I wanna just conclude with some ideas about how Congress can be helpful to support independent journalism, not just in Belarus and in Russia, but elsewhere in the region. Um, fundamentally, independent media, including RFERL, need additional resources to support our work uh, as we face governments that are increasingly targeting journalists, ramping up repression, making it more difficult to reach audiences with internet blockages, uh, targeting websites, uh, and providing access restrictions. Uh, in Belarus, as well as many of the other countries we operate, we need additional statements of support. And I wanna thank uh, many members of the committee for speaking out on the cases of Ihar Losik. We also have a contributor in Ukraine, Vladislav Yesopenko, who has been detained in Russian-occupied Crimea since March and was reportedly tortured. 
And in the last year, we've lost uh, a journalist, Mohammed Ilyas Dayi, in a targeted assassination attack in Afghanistan. And we now have many other Afghan journalists who work for our Afghan service who are facing uh, credible threats to their lives as the US military withdraws. Uh, all of this requires sustained investment and funding at a time when our competitors, including competitors backed by the Russian Federation and China, as it expands its information operations across Eurasia, are committing significant resources to those efforts. Uh, and in some markets, we're increasingly falling behind and finding it difficult to compete. One final note, uh, and you referenced, Mr. Chairman, uh, the developments of the last year at the U.S. Agency for Global Media, we need additional congressional support to ensure our independence from the U.S. government. Our journalists are mostly people working in the countries they were born in and raised in and grew up in, and they provide a local service to their communities. They uh, operate in countries where governments try to paint them all the time as intelligence agents or uh, agents of a foreign power. And while there have been some uh, early positive signs uh, during the Biden administration uh, by the acting leadership of the US Agency for Global Media, the turmoil at that agency, uh, which is supposed to safeguard our independence, has uh, increasingly raised questions amongst our journalists and some of our audiences about the safeguards that have long existed uh, in US statute that are, trying, that are supposed to preserve our independence from any government interference. I'll just end by noting uh, that we're based, as you noted, here in Prague. We're here because Václav Havel invited us uh, after he was a listener to our Czechoslovak service and saw the powerful role that we could play uh, in helping shape what, what became the Velvet Revolution. And uh, he wrote uh, uh, frequently about living in truth, which is a mantra uh, for RFERL. Our bond with our audience has always been based on our respect for the truth. It's drawn, it's drawn audiences to us for decades uh, through efforts to jam and block our signal. Uh, it's drawn audiences to us in Belarus who are using circumvention technology to get around website blockages to this day, submitting their own content to us to use in our reporting. Uh, and we need your uh, sub continued and additional support to help ensure that we can help the Belarusian people in their effort to live in truth as well as all of our audiences across Eurasia who desire uh, the same uh, and are looking to us for independent reporting to help them do that. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Um, I've let you go on for about 10 minutes because I think what you have to say is so important. And we embrace uh, your calls for help. And uh, I will uh, certainly uh, intend to follow up on some of the suggestions you've made, and we may be reaching out to you independently uh, from this hearing uh, to follow up on that. So thank you very much. My understanding now is that uh, we have uh, Ms. Tikhanovskaya on an audio feed that we're doing here through her phone. So Ms. Tikhanovskaya, if you are with us, please go ahead. Uh, Mr. Chairman, ranking member, distinguished members of the committee, Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you on behalf of millions of Belarusians seeking democracy and freedom. I'm here to share my story and to illustrate how Lukashenko's regime has outgrown its borders and became a threat to international peace and security. My personal story started a year ago when my husband, Sergei, announced that he was running for president, challenging the incompetent rule of the dictator. The security forces have kept Sergei arrested ever since. To stand up for my husband's rights, I entered the race instead of him. Other strong candidates, Viktor Babarika and Valery Tsepkala, were either arrested or forced to flee. Ultimately, the three campaigns united forces, and I became the main opposition candidate, campaigning together with Vilanika Tsipkala and Maria Kalisnikova. On August 9, 2020, the dictator blatantly falsified the vote and tried to steal the victory from the people. Through intimidation, the regime forced my children, and then me, to leave Belarus. 
My five-year-old daughter still thinks that prison is some kind of an interesting place, something similar to a work trip. Her 11-year-old brother avoids explaining what it actually means. So do I. Not a single day passes without her asking when her daddy is coming home. Not a single day passes without me asking the same question. This is what life has been like for at least 470 families of political prisoners. And this number continues to grow as Belarusians are protesting every day, unwilling to give in, insisting that the dictator must go and that new elections must take place. The nation reacted massively to Lukashenko's attempt to steal elections. But the regime's only response has been violence. 35,000 detentions, 3,000 political motivated criminal cases, thousands of cases of beatings and torture. There have been at least 10 protest-related deaths. The last deaths were just three weeks ago. We told Ashurak, a political prisoner aged 50, died in a prison camp from a supposed heart failure. His wife said we told never had heart problems. 18-year-old Dmitry Stachowski, an orphan, committed suicide, unable to endure relentless harassment from the investigation committee. The regime is also trying to conceal the truth by repressing the media. Just last month, the security forces closed down to Dubai, the most popular media outlet in the country, and arrested 15 of its employees on trumped-up charges of tax invasion. The next local elections are to be postponed till the end of 2023. The response from the international community to the crackdown against pro-democracy protests has been principled but gradual, sporadic, often symbolic, and diminishing. This helped the regime to adjust and to develop a growing sense of impunity. As a result, on May 23, the dictator reached a turning point. He ordered a military jet to force the landing of a commercial Ryanair flight over Belarus to arrest journalist Roman Protasevich, who was on board. Those reckless actions put the lives of 126 passengers at risk to satisfy the dictator, dictator's uncontained impulse to capture an opponent. New reports reveal that six other commercial planes flying over Belarus on that day were forced to change their routes, putting the lives of many more people at unnecessary risk. This entire incident and the disregard of Lukashenko for people's lives are shocking to international audiences. But Belarusians have been subjected to this kind of lawless treatment every day for the last 10 months and on a broader scale for 26 years already. With this decision, Lukashenko has crossed the line and became a threat to international peace and security. Hence, the international reaction has finally been swift and effective, imposing practical measures and starting an Aikawa investigation. However, the international reaction must not be limited to the Ryanair flight incident. The entire situation in Belarus deserves a comprehensive and unwavering response. Otherwise, we all will face such situations in the future as Lukashenko is turning my country into a North Korea of Europe, non-transparent, unpredictable, and dangerous. The United States, acting together with its partners in Europe and with other like-minded nations, has the power to put a stop to this trajectory. I urge the United States to expand the sanctions against Lukashenko's cronies who finance the regime, including enterprises like Belarus Kali and Mazel Oil Refinery, 
identify sources of foreign funding for the regime and target them. Discuss the crisis in Belarus during high-profile international events like the G7 summit, NATO summit, US-EU summit, and US-Russia meeting, and invite Belarusian democratic forces to participate. Support EU in launching a high-profile international conference on the resolution of the crisis in Belarus involving main stakeholders. Develop a U.S. aid package building up on the EU Comprehensive Plan for Democratic Belarus to assure Belarusians that they will have help when the change comes and to prepare steps to stabilize and reform the economy. The U.S. can also participate in the Associated Donors Forum and Investors Meeting contemplated by the EU. There are other suggestions, and I would like to ask to add to the record an expanded list of suggested steps on the situation in Belarus by the U.S. and other nations. These actions would help build up the momentum to launch and transition to elections, exactly what Belarusians demand. Otherwise, Lukashenko and other dictators around the world will feel impunity to freely break international norms to crush their opponents. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much, Mystika Nuskaya. Uh, we salute your courage and your bravery and those who follow you and the Belarusian people and their aspirations uh, for freedom. Uh, we thank you very much. We will include, when you transmit it to us, your suggested uh, actions uh, into the record and share it with our, with our colleagues. Uh, we'd like to take a few minutes to uh, engage in a conversation with you. Do you still have time? Yes, sure, I'm with you. Okay, very good. So uh, we have several members here, and I'm sure they're going to want to ask questions or make some statements. So let me start off uh, with myself. Uh, I, I heard your list of desired actions. Um, in advance of President Biden's visit to Europe this week, what is your main message that you would like to hear him say? My message is uh, that what's happening in Belarus, it's not about geopolitics. It's our inner crisis, it's our fight against dictator. Not, it's not about other countries, it's uh, against a uh, regime in our country. Okay. And with reference to your call for an international conference to resolve the political crisis, which would include government officials from Belarus and Russia, uh, can you share with the committee what goals you would have for such a gathering and whether such an idea has gained any traction? Uh, we need this conference to unite our efforts to try to solve how to get out of a political crisis in Belarus, uh, how to start dialogue with the regime and how to bring uh, Belarus to new free and fair elections under observation of uh, international organizations. Mm -hmm. Finally, have there been uh, defections from the police and security forces? Absolutely, especially uh, in after August and September events, there were a lot of uh, people from the regime who uh, came to our side. And now uh, we changed a strategy a little bit and we ask uh, people in the regime to stay at their places, but to give us inside information about the moods uh, among people in the regime, to give us uh, documents and video recordings so they are useful there where they work now. Very good. Well, thank you again for joining us and for your testimony. Let me turn to uh, Senator Portman, who I understand you vis uh, visited with you uh, in a recent trip. Senator Portman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for having this hearing and giving uh, Ms. Sikoskana, Sikoskaya an opportunity to address 
the United States Congress and to have in the official record um, her thoughtful presentation regarding what's happening in Belarus today and what she and her fellow patriots have gone through. Um, and it was a pleasure to meet with you in Lithuania last week. I'm pleased to see that uh, Ambassador Fisher not only testified before us today, but she's still here and listened carefully, I saw, to your presentation. One of the things that I think is very important is that in the next couple of weeks, while we have these opportunities with the European Union um, and certainly with the NATO summit, the G7 summit, the meeting with Russian President Putin, that there be a very strong uh, and forceful communication about the importance of us standing by Belarus, all of us who believe in freedom and democracy, and understanding the role that Russia is playing in Belarus. So I thank you for testifying today because I hope that this will help us can you explain just briefly why you think it is so important that the United States provide this message uh, in these fora over the next week or so, and why it is so important that the European Union and the United States continue to stand by uh, those people in Belarus, like yourself, uh, like journalist uh, Roman Pratasevich, uh, who are standing for freedom? Uh, thank you, Senator Putman, for uh, for your uh, question. And uh, you know, the USA is one of the is the oldest democracy and one of the most powerful countries uh, in the world. So uh, I think that it's evident that the message from uh, your representatives will be the most powerful. And uh, you know. First of all, you know, the USA has to act jointly with the European Union and UK and uh, Ukraine and other countries that are, uh, follow the same values, uh, values of democracy, values of law, just to help Belarusian people, uh, you know, to continue uh, their fight. And this, this help uh, should be urgent because people on the ground are suffering so time is very important. We have to avoid uh, uh, impunity uh, of the regime. Uh, we have to uh, assist people because uh, you know it's a very difficult path. And when uh, strong friends uh, together with us, it's much easier to survive. Thank you. You, in your testimony today, talked about the need to expand the sanctions. Um, I noted that you talked specifically about the cronies who finance the regime, including uh, specific enterprises um, and identifying sources of foreign funding for the regime to target them. Uh, do you believe that uh, sanctions that are focused on sectors, important sectors like uh, the oil refinery business you mentioned, could be effective in changing the behavior of the Lukashenko regime? You know, the companies uh, I listed, uh, these are state-owned companies and main pockets of Lukashenko. And of course, he is and his regime are afraid of these sanctions and only threaten of strong sanctions can help to release political prisoners as, and stop violence. If he doesn't have income of, uh, from these enterprises, he will not have money to pay, uh, you know, his... Uh, his cronies and uh, right policemen, and uh, we, we have experience from the past that uh, sanctions helped uh, political prisoners to be released. And for sure, people in Belarus uh, are sure that uh, sanctions, uh, uh, you know, will help in our case. Ms. Sakaniskaya, thank you for coming today. Thank you for your courage. Um, you have, uh, on a bipartisan basis, friends and supporters in this room and throughout the United States Congress and this administration, and we wish you the best. Thank you, Senator Portman. Thank you. Now we turn to Senator Shaheen, who chairs the Europe 
subcommittee of the Foreign Relations Committee, and I know the led a delegation recently to the region. Senator Shaheen. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and Mrs. Tikhanovskaya. Um, it is wonderful to hear from you again. We especially appreciated your willingness to meet with Senator Portman, Senator Murphy, and me in Vilnius last week. I think the people of Belarus are very lucky to have such an impressive, courageous advocate um, on their side. I want to, I'm very concerned about Russia's intentions with Lukashenko and what that may mean for the opposition and the effort to get free and fair elections. The, when we were in the region last week, we heard from folks in Ukraine about, and in Georgia, about the effort to form a union with Belarus and with the provinces in Georgia. Can you talk about whether you think that makes it harder or will have any impact on what you're doing with the opposition in Belarus? Uh, thank you. You know, Putin and Lukashenko have a complicated relationship. They like got used to each other, and in order to retain support of Siloviki, it's very important to demonstrate support of the Kremlin. Otherwise, all his power vertical will collapse. But I don't believe that uh, the Kremlin will support Lukashenko for long. And we do our best to make this support as expensive as possible. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And as Senator Portman and Senator uh, Menendez said, you have strong bipartisan support here in the Congress, and we want to do everything we can to support you and the opposition in Belarus. I, I would like to ask Mr. Fly uh, a question as well, because while we were in Ukraine, we had the opportunity to meet with some journalists who had fled to Kiev from uh, Moscow. And I want to first thank you, Mr. Fly, and all of your reporters who provide real facts to oppress people across Eurasia. And they do it, as you pointed out, at real um, danger to themselves and their families often. But as you're thinking about the challenges that you face if Putin throws all of um, the reporters' RFE, RL out of Moscow and as autocratic governments across Europe and Asia um, look at ways to crack down on the work that you're doing. How can we in Congress be more supportive of your efforts? Thank you for that question, Senator Shaheen. And I, I just want to thank you in particular and Senator Murphy and Senator Portman uh, because the, the visit that you held with our journalists in Kyiv uh, was not just a strong symbol of support to them and those who have recently had to leave Moscow. Uh, when you speak out in that way on, on their behalf, it's noticed by all of our journalists, and I think journalists that don't even work for RFERL, uh, and it gives them more courage to do their job. So, so thank you um, for taking time during your visit to Kyiv. Uh, my concern is that uh, we see this trend in Russia, we see it in Belarus, uh, at differing rates of criminalization of journalism, uh, trying uh, authoritarians trying to control the information space, limit the options for their citizens to state propaganda outlets uh, or outlets that the regime is comfortable allowing because they're non-controversial. Uh, we're seeing that in different forms, at different uh, speeds, uh, but we're seeing them learn from each other and adapt uh, their approaches. In the Russian case, they're using what is called a foreign agent law to target us. Lukashenko has now talked about imposing a foreign agent law in Belarus, uh, which could threaten our presence uh, in Minsk. And so statements of support from the Congress are incredibly helpful. Governments, and I've talked extensively with the U.S. government, with European governments, pushing back against these efforts, making clear that there are repercussions for targeting journalists. 
Senator Kane mentioned earlier, perhaps use of the Magnitsky Act, which I would fully support when journalists are pressured. Uh, and then finally, funding, because we can adapt and we will, uh, even if we lose our bureau in Moscow, even if our journalists are not able to operate inside Belarus, we will adapt our programming and redouble our efforts to reach those audiences. Uh, but that often requires technology, new tactics, which are uh, expensive. And so additional funding uh, from the Congress would also go a long way towards ensuring that we can cont continue to be there for those audiences uh, that need us more than ever in these uh, increasingly difficult environments in both Russia and Belarus. Well, thank you very much. We will take that back and try and act on that and especially appreciate your appearing with the committee this morning and also Mrs. Tikhanovskaya for being with us and we will continue to do everything we can to support your work in Belarus and across for RFERL across Europe and Asia. Thank you. Senator Coons. Um, thank you, Chairman Menendez, uh, and my thanks to Ambassador Fisher and uh, Mr. Fly for championing American values under these very difficult circumstances. Uh, Ms. Tihunovskaya, um, thank you for your courage. Thank you for standing up for uh, democracy um, and for fighting for the rights of the people of Belarus. Uh, they've um, certainly had a very difficult time uh, under the dictatorship of Lukashenko and uh, hopefully are ready to chart a new path and to uh, make a break uh, with what uh, Lukashenko and his actions uh, have shown, namely that in order to retain power, there's no lines he won't cross. Uh, and this hearing is a reminder of how important uh, bipartisan uh, congressional delegations can be uh, in uh, bringing um, connections and information back to this committee and to this country and in advocating uh, for um, the priorities uh, that we shape here. Um, President Biden um, is uh, heading on his first overseas uh, trip uh, this coming week, uh, he's meeting with officials from uh, NATO, from EU, the G7, UK, uh, and I look forward uh, to seeing uh, his leadership in um, organizing the democracies of Europe to fight uh, corruption and support independent media and defend democracy. Um, I'd be interested, if I might, um, Ms. Tuhunovskaya, in hearing from you about how you assess the extent of Russian influence in Belarus, how exactly it's exerted, and how Russian support of the Lukashenko regime is changing Belarusian um, civil society at this time. You know, uh, at the moment, uh, the Kremlin supports Lukashenko diplomatically, politically, and uh, you know, financially somehow. But uh, I have to say, uh, we want friendly relations with all the countries, including Russia, and propaganda is trying to show us that we are against Russia, but this is not true. We are against dictatorship. And it depends on the, on the Belarusians which uh, path they will choose in uh, free and fair elections. Um, thank you, and thank you for um, your brave um, stand and for your service. Mr. Fly, could I just ask you um, what more we could do to support independent journalism in Belarus, and um, do you think we need to provide greater support for anti-censorship tools? Yes, uh, I think additional support would be helpful for anti-censorship tools, for circumvention tools. Uh, as I noted in my testimony, uh, it is only because of those tools at this point that we're able to provide access to our website in Belarus since last August. Uh, the authoritarian governments are always trying to find new ways uh, to block even uh, the circumvention tools. So additional support as well for the Open Technology Fund, which is, uh, also receives its congressional appropriation through the U.S. Agency for Global Media, is in the interest of all of the congressional broadcasters uh, and independent journalists uh, generally, because obviously we, we can produce the best content, but if we can't get it in front of our audiences, it's not gonna have the desired impact. Thank you, thank you for what you're doing and for your persistence in the face of repression. Last, if I might, uh, Madam Ambassador, I'm just curious about how you um, are overcoming the challenges of leading uh, Embassy Minsk without being in the country, um, and how the embassy is able to support and maintain its relationships with civil society in such a repressive context, if you're uh, comfortable sharing some of that. We, we had excused the ambassador already, but if she's willing, I'm happy to have her answer. I apologize. That's okay. <laughs> 
I, I'm quite happy uh, to answer, and, and I appreciate, uh, Senator, very much the question. Um, if I could, I, I would start by telling you, uh, last week the regime announced uh, that they were drawing down our mission in Minsk, that they were going to put a cap on the number of American diplomats who can serve there. Um, I, I would like to acknowledge, particularly for this committee, just how difficult it is to serve in Minsk today. Uh, we have an incredible team there working very hard in support of the American citizens who are there, doing everything they can to work with civil society, the independent media, to meet with the families and the representatives of those who are repressed. Uh, so this is incredibly important work. I think for my work, the challenge that I face is how do I, how are we collectively in the government able to consolidate what we know and what we understand of, from all of the forces at work outside of Belarus and combine that with what we know from the inside. Uh, Lukashenko has done everything he can to keep these worlds separate, and our job is to work with our partners and our allies to develop an understanding of how we can be effective and how it is that we can help build to that new election, to that dialogue, and to the release of political prisoners and a new future for Belarus. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Markey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Um, Ms. Sikhanovskaya, uh, uh, tell us about your husband. We know that you were able to leave the country um, with your children. Tell us about the conditions that your husband is uh, being uh, uh, held under right now in Belarus. In Belarus, people can't communicate to political prisoners. They can't call him or visit them, even they, if uh, relatives are in Belarus. And uh, we communicate only through the lawyer. Uh, we send short messages to each other, usually about you know children and uh, parents and all that stuff. But of course, how can people feel spending years in jail for uh, nothing? We just having strength to say uh, words against Lukashenko. The morally, uh, they um, are awful. Physically, uh, more or less, you know. But they are all detainees. They are all um, hostages, and uh, they rely only on us, on Belarusian people, on international community. They did everything they could and now uh, they can't do anything at all but this is our task to do everything possible to rescue those people uh, this is our task to prove that um, that all of them will return home to their children to their wives to their parents and could hug them thank you yeah, thank you. What is your message to all of those brave young journalists uh, in uh, Belarus who are still um, trying to tell the truth about what is going on in the country? What, what would be your message to those journalists? I want to say that journalists' work is very important. Even in such dangerous situation as in Belarus, please don't stop. While you are vocal, while you are writing, while you are telling the truth, uh, we are visible. And this visibility is very important. Take care of yourself, uh, full I know, security, but write and show the truth to the world. Thank you. And uh, what is your message um, to those journalists right now, Mr. Fly? Well, many of a number of those journalists are our journalists, so I'm very worried about them on a daily basis, and we're doing everything we can to try to make them as uh, safe as possible, give them the tools to communicate securely and to continue to do their jobs. As has been noted in this hearing, uh, it's almost impossible to do on the street journalism because of the laws that the regime has put in place. 
Uh, we've had journalists who literally stepped outside of their apartment to go run an errand and got arrested uh, just for being near a protest. In some cases, they weren't even covering that particular protest, but any act that's seen as being related to doing journalism with a camera, even using a cell phone in a particular way, uh, the authorities are actually using advanced technology to track people who are live streaming protests. It's incredibly dangerous work. And so that community has found ways uh, to adapt. Uh, and so I'm uh, always impressed by the bravery and courage of all of our journalists, but especially our team in Minsk right now who will continue to operate under these challenges. You know, thank you. And uh, Ms. Sikanoskaya, you should just know that your courage and your husband's courage, your family's courage, has really shown a spotlight uh, on the corruption uh, in Belarus. Uh, and we're not going to go away. We're going to continue to pay attention. We're going to continue uh, to shine a spotlight on the injustice which is now being perpetrated by the government of Belarus. So uh, just know that you have friends, more friends than you've ever had before. And uh, we are not going to go away. So thank you so much for your courage. Uh, thank you for your husband and your family's courage as well. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator Markey. So let me uh, just turn to Mr. Fly, and then we will wrap up this hearing. Uh, can you give us an update on the latest on RFE, uh, RL, freelance uh, Vladislav Yesipenko, who has been jailed and tortured in Russian-occupied Crimea. I know the UN Human Rights Monitoring Mission in Ukraine and the U.S. Mission to the OSCE has spoken out on his behalf. Is there a trial date that has been set? Uh, what else can we do to help secure his freedom? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for asking about Vladislav. Uh, I was in Kyiv two weeks ago in part to talk to the Ukrainian government about his case to try to raise awareness about his uh, situation. Uh, he did testify when he first appeared uh, at a public hearing that he had been tortured, uh, that they had tried to force him to claim that he was working for Ukrainian intelligence instead of doing what we know he was doing, which was gathering information for our uh, Crimea realities project of our Ukrainian service. Uh, we believe that he has been targeted by uh, the Crimean authorities backed by the Russian FSB. Uh, and that obviously is incredibly uh, concerning. So we hope that as uh, the Biden administration engages uh, President Putin uh, and in other settings where hopefully Ukrainian officials will be able to talk to their Russian counterparts, that we can negotiate Vladislav's uh, release uh, he also has a, a wife uh, and uh, children who are waiting for him at home. And I also spoke recently to his wife, uh, who is only able to communicate with him right now uh, through the lawyer, just as many of the prisoners in uh, Belarus. And so we're very concerned with this uncertainty about uh, his trial and uh, how he will then be treated even once the trial is held. All right, we will follow up with the administration. And lastly, Russian authorities often try to equate U.S. policy and regulations towards state-run broadcasters like RT and Sputnik with Russia's application of, quote, foreign agent laws to U.S. government finance media organizations like RFERL. What's wrong with this analogy? Thanks for that question. I've, I've had these conversations with Russian officials in the past uh, when I visited Moscow a bit over a year ago. And my response to them was that I wish we were treated the same way uh, at the time because RT and Sputnik, as far as I know, have no limitations on their ability to access the American audience. Uh, any American can watch RT on satellite or cable. Sputnik has concluded radio agreements uh, with radio stations in the United States and RFERL, Voice of America, other US funded outlets uh, lost all access to those platforms years ago, uh, uh, earlier in the Putin tenure, uh, which is why we've turned to online to, to reach audiences and we've been incredibly successful, nearly doubling our audience in Russia over the last five years. And it is now that online audience that the authorities are trying to target with the foreign agent labeling requirement they've tried to impose on us, which we have refused 
uh, to comply. And so although the Kremlin propaganda says that they're just doing to RFRL what Department of Justice does to RT and Sputnik, that is fundamentally untrue and uh, not the case. Yeah. I asked you the question knowing the answer, but I think it's important that we establish it for the record that, that there is a fundamental difference. Uh, in an open society as we are, we permit even those adverse uh, entities uh, like uh, RT and Sputnik to engage freely in our society, um, and we take the associated risk, but we don't get the commensurate response in totalitarian, authoritarian governments. So uh, this is the challenge. Uh, I want to thank all of our witnesses today, Ambassador, who's still here listening to both of your testimonies, uh, Ms. Tikhanovskaya, for your courage, bravery, and for your advocacy. You're uh, an example not just for Belarusians, but for others in the world. And uh, Mr. Fly, to you and the men and women of your journalism who, with their pen, send a, a beacon of hope uh, and information to people uh, across the globe and in places where uh, they do not have that opportunity to independently understand what's happening in their own country and in their region. Uh, these are extraordinary people. And uh, I want you to know you have the thanks of the committee for your respective endeavors. And we will follow up on some of these initiatives uh, to see that we can hasten the day in which Belarusians uh, can determine their own future. Uh, that we will hasten uh, the time in which journalists uh, can be able to exercise their profession with uh, not the impunity of governments, and we, we can get Ambassador Fisher to her post uh, in uh, Belarus. So uh, thank you all. This, this hearing's uh, record will remain open until the close of business tomorrow. And with the thanks of all of the members of the committee, this hearing is adjourned.